Let's start. Welcome back, everybody. Hi. Listen up. Um, today, what I'm going to talk about is um, the study of a particular object that some people believe or say is the sort of core object of study of the web, and that's the website. Um, and <coughs> this might be changing, of course. I think it was now about four years ago um, that the web was declared dead um, and the app, the app market was, uh, was uh, seen to be in, in ascendancy and taking over from the web. And it's interesting um, to note, and I read this very recently, that something like 60% of the web traffic um, these days comes from mobile apps in the US. Uh, so in some sense, the web is both dead and alive. So dead in the sense that maybe it's not being accessed through uh, the, the desktop, but alive in the sense that it's being accessed uh, through other means. Question. This was American web or is this the entire web? This was American research. Um, okay, sorry, American web. <laughs> on, on, I think, the, yeah, I'm quite sure it's the US, US market. Okay, um, so I want to talk about website studies and, and then I want to talk about the approach to website studies that we'll be taking and that is to study the website uh, as an archived object. Um, so, be But before I get there, uh, I want to introduce um, website studies and, and this is a large area and I'm just going to touch on some of it um, and then go into depth about the archived web and archived websites. But the website studies is, is, is large. Um, and it has a lot to do, first of all, with design, uh, web design. And web design can be divided up into a number of different areas. Um, one would be um, color palettes. Another would be... Um, interactivity and navigation. Uh, and of course, um, another one would be uh, website optimization mm -hmm. strategies for um, engines finding websites and engines indexing websites. So at least those areas, if not, if not more. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in particular, I'd like to talk about um, what is referred to as usability studies, which is a huge area in website studies. Um, what are sort of usable websites? What is decent website design and what is not? Um, and why? And in particular, uh, for the purposes of advertising, um, and what, what, does a what does a website look like from an advertising point of view? And how is that different from a sort of reader's point of view or an engine's point of view? We'll talk about that. And then I want to talk about how the social sciences oftentimes uh, approach the study of the website, uh, just so you've seen it. Um, and uh, um, there's been a lot of studies about how um, the, the extent to which interactivity on a website translates into sort of empowerment. The more, the more interactive a website, the more empowering it is for its users. Um, even perhaps the more democratic it is, and these are the, just the classic distinctions that are made between old media and new media, where old media was sort of one-way media, new media are meant to be two-way media. Um, so I'd like to also talk about that. So first, um, oh yeah, and then subsequently, um, zoom into the website as archived object. And I'll do that in three different ways. I want to talk about um, web history, web historiography. So how to do history with the web. And there are a number of different histories that can be done with the web. One can do web history, uh, but one can also do history uh, using the web as a data source. So uh, we'll talk about that also with respect to archived websites and web archiving and the kinds of um, traditions or historiographical traditions that are embedded into archives uh, and how that has changed over the last um, 
15 years, 20 years now? How long has the web been? The web started being archived in 1995, late 95, 1996. Um, so something like two years after its, not after its very inception, but after its, uh, after the um, Mozilla, uh, after, after the first browser, um, Mosaic browser from, from 1993. So two years after that, the, at the end of 1995, at the beginning of 1996, the web was being archived for the first time. And some people, when I say this, or when people say this, the web is archived, they're like, what? Uh, I, I had never heard of this. Um, that the web would be archived, that the web could be archived, um, and the issues surrounding it, how much of the web is archived, uh, and how is it done? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I, I think more importantly, or most importantly for our purposes, uh, I'd like to talk about what to do with web archives. So how do we actually use them uh, as researchers? So a lot, most of the work, if you start searching and, and researching uh, web archiving, you'll notice that most of the work is about the archiving thereof and not about how to use the archives uh, and for what purposes. Um, and the web arguably is a little bit different from um, other media, archiving other media in the sense of um, that it's considered to be an unstable medium. It's um, a lot of the content uh, is um, considered to be ephemeral. Websites are, are difficult to define um, what the borders or the, or are of, of a website. Websites are generated on the fly. Um, there are different elements of a website. So it's difficult to, to decide what's, what's in a website and what's not. Um, so, so there are a lot of issues to web archiving, um, but there are also a lot of issues to the use of web, web archives. And, and web archives traditionally have not been used that much. And so we're going to talk about different approaches to using, using web archives, and in particular the approaches uh, also developed here uh, in digital methods. So how how do digital methods, if you will, approach the, archive, the, the website as an archive object and web archives? What to do with them? So that's where I'll uh, conclude. But let's start off <coughs> with, with some uh, discussion about <coughs> website design. And I want to start off with colors. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the fact that um, the web um, has dominant colors. Now, the, the web is blue, or at least th th that's the dominant color of the web. Um, and there's been different kinds of research going into this. I, I mean, most of it comes from marketing, but also from, from different kinds of design traditions. Um, and what you see here is an example thereof. Um, this is a piece of work uh, done by a group, a design cult consultancy called Entrepo, uh, Istanbul-based. Um, this is a set of prints that you can actually purchase. They're called clickable colors. The whole set, I just noticed recently, costs $350, which is quite uh, a decent price. Um, what they did here um, <coughs> is took Alexa and the global and the top websites according to Alexa, and then extracted the dominant color from the website, and then made a sort of ranking. Um, to show um, the, the colors of, of the web. And, and what you see immediately is, is that the dominant color is blue, um, followed um, uh, in, in different markets by other colors. Uh, in the US, it's red. <coughs> in other countries, there, there are different colors. And then the colors are also differ per genre, if you will, or website type, uh, with the dominant color remaining blue, interestingly enough, even if you move into other realms you would imagine that in the medical realm, the dominant uh, uh, color would be red. Um, uh, nevertheless, in any number of different categories, it remains uh, blue. Uh, when uh, discussing this uh, with others, uh, especially Michael Dieter um, a couple of years ago, what he mentioned was that it's not uh, so surprising that the dominant color of the web is blue, given the fact that blue was the first commercial color. So if you notice, um, I don't know if you go to an antique shop here in Amsterdam, um, you'll notice all of these porcelain things called Delft Blue. Um, 
So this was the first sort of dominant color that was sort of traded internationally, globally, uh, in, in mercantilist circles. Um, uh, the, the trade came from indigo and all of the various um, dyeing techniques that were developed were developed predominantly in, in, in the early going around, around blue. So blue, in fact, is, I mean, if you look at the web as a sort of commercial space, uh, blue is, is a sort of a, a, a very commercial, uh, at least historically commercial color. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the second uh, tradition I want to talk a little bit about uh, in terms of the uh, web website design um, is, um, is the template. Um, what's this? Facebook. Yeah. It's interesting that you can, and this is an old one, but you might still recognize it. Where? Ah, okay, very good. So, so what you what you notice are a couple of things. First of all, in, in the sense that you can <laughs> identify these very quickly, uh, these um, uh, you know are, are, are of course branding exercises. But on the other hand, when one depopulates or voids a template of its content, one is reminded of uh, a couple of things. First, um, the quote-unquote templatization uh, of, of, the, of the web. So over, over the years, the web um, has uh, gone from a kind of yeah, tinkerer's space, a space of, of you know, people uh, mucking or messing about with, with HTML to an off-the-shelf space, um, which has uh, in its off in, in its off-the-shelfness uh, a number of conventions, um, and and there, thereby moving from a kind of craft-like space to a more industrialized space. That's number one. But number two, probably more importantly, um, is where the content comes from. And when one voids um, sites like Facebook of uh, content so, uh, so as to strip it just to its template, one realizes uh, that these spaces rely on you, rely on its users uh, to populate it, um, and rely on its users' um, uh, labor. Um, someone, some would call it free labor, um, to, in order to create value for the website. So this is a classic uh, critique of um, the, the, the kind of economy we're in now, the web economy being one of, a, of, of free labor, uh, in, in, or, in order to create value for these massive um, uh, platforms. So Facebook, the valuation um, was astronomical. Twitter somewhat less so, but nevertheless uh, extremely high, populated uh, by, by, by user content. Um, there have been a number of... Um, shows, uh, artworks, um, gallery shows, where one has, where artists have taken the content out of websites um, in order to um, show a number of different things, but certainly templatization of the web, so the industrialization of the web, um, and, uh, and, and concomitantly, uh, and additionally, the, 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 the rise of a particular kind of economy that results in um, quote unquote user generated content creating value for large platform companies. Okay, I'm just glossing over some of the issues in, in website design. Uh, I think one of the larger areas um, in the applied, er in the applied um, sciences is, is of course um, usability. Now I, I, I highlight this kind of fairly well-known book from uh, years ago, which has gone into a series of editions, um, which is a, so which was one of the first sort of major uh, usability books um, by Steve Krug, Don't Make Me Think. Now, Don't Make Me Think as, an, as, a, as a kind of uh, mantra for successful website design. Don't make me think, meaning place the uh, menus where we would expect them, um, and uh, you know, across the top and, and down the and down the side, uh, provide 
uh, a site map, things like this, although site maps are now, uh, I think, quite severely in decline. Um, nevertheless, the idea of, 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 of not having to have the users think as a dominant mode of website consumption versus a more of a kind of um, uh, poetics of navigation, uh, which was something, which was a competing school of thought um, at the time, uh, to indeed make me think, uh, and not just robotically uh, or, or unthinkingly just click, uh, but rather we want, we would like to have the web be a, be a thinking person's medium as opposed to a uh, click and go, uh, and so and, and this this kind of um, tension between the don't make me think school of thought and the poetics of navigation school of thought um, arguably has uh, uh, resulted in a more of, more of, a, of, of a kind of uh, sort of click, 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 don't make me think web. Um, but there's still some examples of, of websites which, uh, you know, uh, try to actually have you stop um, and, and not immediately kind of uh, click through, scroll away, uh, move on. I want to um, talk a little bit about um, the advertiser's web uh, and, 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 and its impact on design. Um, these are, are two images um, which are quite pixelated, but that doesn't matter. The point of showing them um, is the difference between how one thinks someone looks at a website um, and how people actually look at a website. Um, so when one is designing your um, front page, oftentimes one will assume that the, that the user or the reader will basically look at most everything. When in fact, um, the, the user or the reader has a particular kinds of patterns of consumption of a, of a website. And these patterns of consumption um, have, uh, in fact, um, turned the web page into a piece of real estate, if you will. Um, so there are parts of this page uh, that are more valuable than other parts. Um, and the value of these parts of the page um, derives largely from um, eye tracking studies. So the usability studies, particularly usability for the purposes of site design as well as for um, selling of advertisement, uh, rely on eye tracking. And eye tracking um, is uh, something that you, I mean, if you were to go and intern at a, at a usability uh, company or if you were to go to the Applied Sciences uh, Department over um, in the science faculty, um, what you would find would be a lot of equipment um, to basically track how you're looking at websites. And, and this is probably the most famous uh, image uh, or output of, uh, of usability studies, at least in marketing circles. And it was um, done by a Toronto-based company called Inquiro, uh, which, uh, has, which has changed its name to Mediative. And in 2005, they came out with a study um, that they, um, uh, and a finding uh, that they, that they sort of coined or dubbed the Golden Triangle of Search. And the Golden Triangle of Search means that uh, this is a search engine results page, a SERP, as it's called in the industry. Um, and the red indicates where the eyeballs go, where the eyes go. Um, and the, the darker uh, it is, um, the fewer, the, little, the less attention there is. So what you see here suddenly is the value of the top results. And, um, and the, and, and, at a search engine results page, um, authoring, uh, if you will, highly valued spaces. Um, and the fact that if you are the top result, you will be seen. If you're the second result, you'll be seen. And then as it goes down, you see the chances of your, your being looked at. No, not, not necessarily even clicked. Looked at uh, goes, goes down. Um, 
but you also see where, where, where the value is. Now, this is the same company, um, 2011, uh, MediaTip, and they're doing um, usability research and eye tracking research um, on um, uh, Google Maps. Uh, and they, again, identify a kind of triangle um, and they also identify um, that uh, when, l when looking at this particular page, the, the user doesn't necessarily navigate um, to the top left, but rather directly to the image. Behind this, this red dot is an image. So depending on the design elements of the page, eyes also can shift, um, not necessarily to the top left. Now, I think it was... Um, two days ago that, that Mediative came out uh, with its most recent study and it is kind of shocking in the sense that, that they have changed um, their, 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 their sort of seminal finding. Um, so, the, and what, what's, what's interesting um, is they now argue that, that we no longer have a kind of golden triangle of search but we now have a kind of, <coughs> I, don't know, I don't know if we should call it a golden rectangle um, or more of a splodge. Um, but, but what you see here is that the, the most attention is not necessarily top left any longer. Why is that? What these folks argue is because the organic results the sort of non-ad results are, not, are, are no longer um, uh, top left. So, so the top left, or that valuable space, is now an advertising space, obviously, right? Because, because it was the most valuable. Um, but the other thing that they say, which is quite intriguing, and I don't think they have evidence for this, but okay. Uh, they write that mobile devices have habitually conditioned searches to scan vertically more than horizontally. Um, so, so, so because of, because of mobile phone, smartphones um, and our scrolling behavior, uh, we now um, look for content going da downward. And, and then we are able to find the organic content. So in this particular case, um, we see that the, the most valuable content is below the, uh, below the kind of Google properties um, and below <coughs> um, all of the various uh, uh, sort of Google elements that, that are placed here. So whether it's the knowledge graph or the ad carousel or, or um, Google images or everything, it's, it's users now look beneath that um, for, the, for the first result. Okay, now I, I want to mention another major tradition um, in uh, website studies and in, um, in, in, in a way, usability studies. And that's search engine optimization. Now, this is probably the one of the most famous early works on, on search engine optimization. Uh, search engine op optimization for dummies uh, by, by Peter Kent. Um, it's interesting, I one time had a student compare, this is the third edition, I one time had, had, had a student compare each of, the, each of the editions of search engine optimization for dummies to see what counted um, as um, um, good search engine optimization or white hat or proper or decent as opposed to black hat or underground or manipulative. You know, so what was, and, and that has shifted massively over the years. So what was, con once what was considered good practice is, is is now considered a not so good practice. Um, in any case, uh, what is important to realize when thinking about um, uh, search engine optimization and thinking about um, how one um, designs a, a web page or website is that most of your visitors uh, will not be humans. This is sort of like, oftentimes like quite shocking for people. You know, they, they sort of design websites for, you know, readers. Um, whereas, in fact, um, 
the, the website, in, in some sense, should first and foremost be designed probably for two other things. So first of all, for, for bots, uh, but second of all, for uh, uh, devices, so different sizes, um, you know, responsive web design, the whole thing. So, 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 so these are, these are, these are um, major considerations. Now, um, who is it? Jaron, uh, uh, Jaron Lanier's book, um, I Am Not a Gadget, Starts the, the, quite a well-known. He's the, he's the sort of uh, one of the considered to be the in, one of the inventors of virtual reality. Um, in I think it was 2011 he published the book. I'm not a gadget. And the first line of the book in the preface was, um, um, "If you're reading this, uh, you as a human you'll be in the minority. Most of the readers of this will be bots um, and other sort of machines that take this content and index it." redistribute it, aggregate it, put it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Chop it, dice it uh, in, in, all, in all varieties uh, and, and ways um, so that it can be searched, found, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So this, and, and, and one of the major, um, well, let's say dashboards uh, driving the, the way in which a website <coughs> is Kind of constructed for bots uh, is, um, is is Google Analytics. <coughs> okay, um, I want to move to the to the last part of this of this introduction to, to website studies and, and talk a little bit about it and really gloss over um, uh, the social sciences and, and talk about how social social sciences oftentimes um, study study websites um, and. What this is, this is one example. It's, it's such a clear example. Um, it's, a, it's a study of um, American um, presidential campaign websites from a number of years ago. Um, but what you see here is uh, a classic social scientific means of studying um, features and content of a website. You have uh, a kind of matrix. You have the websites, the, the names of the candidates on the top. Then you have a list of all the features. Um, so it's a, it's a cumulative list. So you would go through all of the websites and create a cumulative list of all the features. And then one by one, see whether or not each of the websites have those features. And then draw inferences or conclusions on the basis of which sorts of features are used and which sorts of features are not used. Now, a lot of this work um, had to do, as I said previously, um, with um, the levels of interactivity, uh, the, the means by which um, the voter, uh, in this particular case, could talk back to the candidate. So is the web a kind of a me an empowering medium, a medium um, that allows for, for more um, interaction, more two-way communication, as opposed to the one-way communication of old media and or broadcast media, and in particular, whether or not the web as participatory space, therefore, is, is more empowering, more, more democratic. And so this is an example of a, a sort of social scientific project that takes a, a, a category or a set of websites um, and then looks at the, looks at the, the, the features, codes them, or codes the websites, if you will, um, so as to draw inferences uh, about um, that collection. OK. That was a. Um, a quick tour through uh, what I would refer to as website studies. And what I want to go into now in more detail, more depth, um, is, is the, the subject of, uh, of this week's uh, digital methods undertaking. And that is the website as archived object. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, I, I want to talk about um, doing history uh, with the web. Um, and in particular, asking ourselves the question of, so what does the web add um, as a form of media um, to other media that's used to do history, uh, to study history? And in order to answer that question, uh, I want to talk about how, um, how web archiving practices embody particular 
historiographies. So um, when, when websites are archived, the, the purpose for the archiving, in some sense, shapes what kind of history can be uh, done with those archived websites. And so I'll explain that uh, in more detail in a minute. Once, uh, once, the web, once websites are archived, one of the major questions is how can they be, how can the web archives be used? Um, and then we have a sort of approach, a digital methods approach um, uh, of repurposing um, uh, the dominant machines, um, in particular the Wayback Machine, to do um, work with web archives. I'd like to, yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a periodization uh, of, of web archiving. Um, and as you can see from this periodization, um, all of these four traditions that I'm going to uh, identify and talk about um, are still ongoing. Um, so this is an overlapping or layered um, history or periodization. There, as far as I can um, see, and then the, the recent period is, of course, as with any recent period, is, is messy and hard to periodize. But as far as I can um, see, uh, there have been uh, probably four hours or of at least four hours of, um, of web archiving. The, and, and each of these eras, and this is the argument that I would like to make, each of these eras correspond to a particular historiographical tradition. Um, there's the Internet Archive uh, itself. And the Internet Archive, which started, yeah, sort of late 1995, 1996, um, has a uh, tradition, uh, has a means of searching it, has a means of navigating it, which lends itself to doing single site histories, to looking at the history of a single website. Um, so that's what I call the biographical historiography, or the biographical that's the kind of history that can be done with that sort of archive. Later, um, in web archiving, there, there started, there emerged the, the tradition of creating a collection or a special collection. And interestingly enough, these special collections were made around particular types of things. Um, normally, elections and disasters. So elections and disasters became the sort of dominant reason, rationale, in order to make a collection of websites and store them and save them. Um, and and there's, uh, uh, there's also another um, occasion, and that is a transition. Uh, so when, uh, when there's a regime change, when um, there's a new president uh, of, the, of the US, or when there's a new pope, the transition from one to the other is that, that particular period um, is also those websites are also archived, and this is this is um, quite clearly an e event-based uh, historiography. So there is an event, and then we want to um, save the websites around that event. Now, after after that, um, but still, I guess overlapping, um, we have seen the rise, the massive rise of the national libraries um, taking over, in some sense. Um, the uh, activity of web archiving. And when the, national, when the national libraries take over web archiving, they come with another way of seeing the web. Um, they don't see the web necessarily as, a, as, 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 um, as an event-based medium or as, as, some, as a whole, um, something that, that should be saved as a whole, but rather, as, an, as national webs, or things of national interest. So you get a kind of national <coughs> historiography being introduced. So there's a Dutch national web archive. There's a British national web archive. There's a New Zealand national web. There's a Swiss national web archive, etc. There's a French one. And, and there's a Danish one. And there's a Swedish one. Um, and, the, the, and then they want to save a web that is relevant to, uh, in some sense, uh, their their country. Um, and now finally, uh, and most recently, uh, arguably, we have um, now 
started to move into an era where we are saving um, things that were difficult to save, that is social media, but then saving them um, uh, in a particular way. And that is saving, in some sense, the individual or a collection of individuals. And so we now are moving into what you could call a kind of autobiographical historiography or as the newly coined uh, term has it, the selfie historiography. Right. So this is, this is very recent, and I'll, and I'll show you some, some examples of that and how uh, archiving has now shifted, or, or at least one mode of it um, has, is emerging around the, the autobiographical. So let's go back, let's go way back, um, to the, way back, the founding of the Wayback Machine by um, Brewster Kale. So this is um, um, in 1996. Now, what's, what's so fascinating about the Internet Archive and about the Wayback Machine um, is, in, in some ways, the fact that, and this, the first quotation here, in some sense, sums it up, um, where he says, I usually work on projects from the you've got to be crazy stage, um, but eventually everyone ends up saying, of course. What he did, you've got to be crazy, what he, what he did was to say that we're going to archive the web, the whole thing, um, you know, starting now. Um, and of course, everyone's like, well, you're crazy. Uh, how, I, how are you going to archive the web? It's, first of all, it's massive, and how do you, how do you collect it? Um, uh, how, is that, how is that possible? So what he um, came up with, and this is quite uh, brilliant, especially for its times, was he created a tool um, called the Alexa Toolbar, uh, which people would download. And the Alexa Toolbar, people still download it, not in as much as they used to, because there's less reason to. Um, but there was a reason back then, because what Kale um, offered was a solution to the, to the major problem at the time, and that was the 404, the file not found problem of the 1990s. And what Kale offered was, if you install this toolbar, when you visit a site that says, file not found, 404 error, um, the toolbar will have this small little button that starts kind of pulsating, which means that that particular website that you're on is in the archive, and you can visit. So we, he's going to solve the, the 404 problem. Um, but in exchange for your receiving these websites that are now offline from the archive, receiving them from the archive, these websites that are now offline, you agree to allow your surf history to be logged so that our crawlers can visit the sites that you visit and archive them. So that's the exchange. Um, and this is sort of what it looked like. Um, this is the toolbar from the, from the 1990s. Um, and it gives you a number of options. You can see, for, you can get site, site information when you're visiting a website. You can get site information so you can see, for example, how fresh a website is. Is it fresh or is it stale? Um, you also see um, that you get um, related websites. So if you're on a particular website, you can see what other websites are related to it, and um, how fast it loads, how many links it has, sort of how popular it is, how authoritative it is. But here's that little button, uh, the Wayback button, um, which you can click, and if you've got a 404, you can actually go to the, go to the, uh, the stored website. Now, the Wayback Machine is interesting because you navigate it um, in, in arguably a sort of 1990s way. You enter a URL instead of a keyword. So, right, so this, is the, this is not, this is, this is the, the assumption of the, the web as a kind of surfer space as, or surfer's medium as opposed to a web as a searcher's medium. Um, and when you enter a URL, what you get 
um, is a interface which shows you um, the archived websites and the dates. So here's Google.com is the year 2000. You see at the top. Um, and then you see that in May 10, 11, 12, 19, 20, they have saved the front page of Google, Google.com. And then the, the larger um, it is, the, the more impressions. Um, now, I want to show you really briefly um, one of the, Eric didn't want me to do this, but I'm going to show you anyway, because this is the old interface um, of the uh, Internet Archive. But the reason why I'm showing it to you is because what's important to know is that some uh, is this asterisk. Um, and, and, and the lesson of this is that sometimes they save new content, and sometimes they save uh, the content they had previously saved. So in this particular case, the asterisk mean that, that something's changed on the, on the front page. And this is important to know. So it, it, what, it, what it means is that if you're going to try to, to um, look at the history of a website, uh, you don't need to look at every single one of them. You can just look at the ones where there's been a change. Uh, so this, it's, it's, a, it's an important uh, footnote. Um, a couple of things about the, the Wayback Machine which are extremely intriguing and, and, and kind of theorizable and historicizable um, is that what the Wayback Machine does is it tries to give you a surfing experience. So if you are on an archived website and you click a link, um, it goes to that page but it doesn't go to that page from necessarily the same date as the archived website. So it's not, it, it kind of jump, jumps through time in order that you can surf um, and have this kind of seamless or frictionless experience, a kind of a surfer's web, again, from sort of the 1990s sort of idea. Um, and if there is no archived page, it goes to the current web. So it seriously jump cuts through time in order to preserve the, um, the surfing experience. Um, so this is the, this is the Wayback Machine, uh, and we, um, we're going to use it this week, and we'll talk about um, uh, how to use it or different approaches to using it um, in a minute. Okay, the second um, historiographical tradition uh, is the special collection tradition. Um, and this is a tradition uh, which, as I said, is based on, on um, collecting websites around events. And, um, and most predominantly around um, elections and, and disasters and, and traditions. And there's a particular um, technique that was developed by colleagues, uh, Kirsten Foote and Steve uh, uh, Schneider, um, of collecting websites. So in the first, in the, in the, um, Wayback Machine tradition, the, the, the approach is to collect all the web. In this particular tradition, the, the, the approach is to collect websites based on an event. And they do it um, with uh, a technique what they called web sphere analysis. So they define a kind of sphere. Um, and this sphere is defined as uh, both in substantively as well as temporally. So the sphere has a particular content and has a particular a duration, and the duration is a sort of, is because it's event-based, it's a kind of attention cycle duration. Um, so they define a web sphere as a set of dynamically defined digital resources, often, often connected by hyperlinks, spanning multiple websites relevant to a central event, concept, or theme, and bounded temporally. Um, now, this is sort of the, quite an interesting definition of a collection. Because on the one hand, um, it is a, a definition um, which is kind of editorial, it's substantive. But on the other hand, um, it's also in some sense technical or spherical in, in the sense that these websites are linked, oftentimes linked. Right? So, so it, 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 um, in some ways it, it 
provides a kind of new media uh, approach um, to collection making. So not only is it thematic, but they're also linked, um, or webby, a, a, a webby approach to, uh, to collection making. This is their original project, uh, webarchivist.org, um, and some of the original uh, uh, projects. Now, um, there's a, they, they are responsible um, for the famous um, September 11th uh, web collection. And it's a collection um, which, is a, which, was extreme, which is very remarkable for the way in which it came together. Um, they were, um, in the midst of preparing to archive an election, um, uh, the, uh, the 2000 uh, uh, congressional election in the US, and they were preparing for it uh, when um, disaster struck. And they had the infrastructure in place um, and the, the, the know-how um, in place to immediately turn to collecting around this event. So I, I think it was September the 12th, they immediately started. Um, and they were able to amass uh, a quite, a, uh, quite an impressive collection of, of, of websites so that's, that's now a part of the, uh, the US Library of Congress. Um, uh, and they subsequently, um, there was sort of through the September 11th one that they started collecting uh, websites around these events, disasters. They were already doing elections. So they were the ones who sort of set the tone for this particular style of, of web archiving, uh, elections and, and disasters. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the lists of, um, of, of special collections. Um, this one is a, from the Library of, of Congress. You see that a lot of them are event-based. The crisis in Darfur, the Iraq war. Um, my uh, a favorite is the is the, uh, the papal transition, um, which, we'll, uh, which we'll come to in a minute. Okay, the third um, tradition, uh, historiographical or web archiving tradition, is the, is the national one. Um, and, and the national libraries got involved in web archiving uh, also in the 1990s, um, but really it started in earnest or, or with multiple um, national libraries collecting um, in, the, in the early 2000s. And the question for the national libraries, um, uh, of course, had to do with the public interest, um, what should be saved. Of course, they have um, uh, experience with, with archiving the public record. As well as, as as other things of, of national interest, um, and they also some countries have vehicles to do so. They have these national deposit laws that that, uh, that requires that that which is published in a particular country is then archived in the in the national library or the national archive. Some countries don't have um, such a such a law, the, uh, uh, such as the Netherlands. Um, there's no there's no sort of legal deposit um, a law. Although there has been some legislation that, that allows for the question of opting in versus opting out, um, you'll be interested to know that the National uh, Library wrote to me, um, I think, of two weeks ago, and said that digital methods.net will now be archived for posterity by the Dutch um, National Archive or the National Library. Um, so, so they archive selectively. Um, they choose a number of websites. They don't archive them all. And this selectivity uh, is something that I want to want to talk about. And then, what kinds of history or historiography can 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 be done uh, with a with a national um, um, approach? This is, um, in some sense, the the classic definition of what constitutes a national web. And 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 it's. It's, um, it, was, it was done by the Danish um, web, archive, web, web archivists, and it's been taken over by most other um, national archives as well. And it, it's a very intriguing definition of, so this is now what's to, what is to be archived, um, and, it's, and it's the national. So for the, for the Danes, and for, for uh, also other, one, other national libraries, it's websites which have the top 
level country domain, so in the Danish case, it's .dk, in the Dutch case, it's .nl, et cetera. Um, also, websites that are intended for a Danish uh, audience or are written in Danish. Um, so the same can be said of other ones written in French or intended for the French. Um, or, or no, and uh, websites uh, about uh, the Danish people or about Denmark, about significant figures. So if there's a website in English uh, about for example, Hans Christian Andersen, which is the, the famous Danish writer, 19th century um, author, children's books. Um, that would be included. And then this last category, was which, which, which I really love, um, is and then more or less anything of interest um, to, the, to, to the Danish people, um, which then suddenly um, moves um, what could be considered, at least in the first two categories, an automated process um, to a very kind of selective editorial one. So it's, this is in some sense the, you know, the moving very far away from Bruce Kale's initial way back machine, crowdsourcing URLs, people installing a toolbar, trying to archive the entire web, uh, the spirit of archiving the entire web to very selective uh, policies, uh, which are also editorial ones, which aren't automated ones. Um, so, so th this is this is where where web archiving has has uh, has come to, um, and this is the national turn. And so, when you then begin to think about what kind of what kind of uh, history um, you can you can write or you can study with these kind of archives, it's very very different from the other two approaches, from the event based or from the grab them all based. Um, I want to um, talk about how to use web archives and, and, the, and the kind of you know, the, the dominant um, problems with or the what's called oftentimes the crisis in, in web archive use, um, and I'll, I'll do that after the break. So ten fifteen. <laughs>